The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So you can see what we're about to do. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen. I'm just going to just double check what you can see. Okay, so what we're going to aim to do is we're going to aim to build this building. Uh, it's by no means finished. Um, it needs a few more sort of little details, but we're going to go through best practice workflows from taking AutoCAD through to a finished Revit model. Uh, so the 2D to 3D workflow and some of the benefits perhaps of having the 3D model and um, using 3D workflows as well. So I actually have this in a CAD format and this, we only have half an hour, so I'm not going to be able to show everything how I got from A to B, uh, but we're going to go through sort of best practice tips for bringing in your um, 2D CAD work into Revit perhaps and then actually working over the top of it to create the 3D. Um, so this is a fairly simple house. Um, like I say, I am going to kind of blue Peter some of this stuff and, and move forward with some of it. Um, my name is Johnny, by the way, I'm from Man and Machine. Um, hopefully you're all aware of us. Um, but yeah, essentially I'm going to jump straight into it just because we're a little bit short of time. So talking about 2D to 3D, this, let's say, was um, perhaps an architect's drawing. I used to work like this all the time. I'd receive an architect's drawing and my background structural and we'd take the architect's 2D and we'd bring it into Revit and then build our 3D over the top of it. Um, and it would always kind of look like this. You'd always have the elevations, plans, and they'll be in different places um, inside the DWG. But essentially, maybe we have um, somebody who's just working purely in a, in a sort of CAD format, 2, 2D format. So what I suggest you do before you bring it into Revit, so I'm going to assume a little bit of um, Revit knowledge with this. I'm just going to save. I'm going to open a completely fresh project. Um, to start this off. So I'm going to go to my architectural template. So just starting up a new template. It's much easier um, when you're working to have a Revit template. It's going to have all of the types of walls that you need, perhaps that you use on a regular basis, all the same families. And these are just similar to, say, blocks in AutoCAD. Um, but having all of these, all of those things in your template is really going to speed up and save time when you come to do this kind of thing. But I'm just going to go through a little bit about how I got or how I would start off with the CAD um, to Revit. So the first thing I would do, um, and by the way, I forgot to say, if anybody has any questions during this, please do ask them. There is a questions page inside the um, go to webinar feature, and I'll do my best to answer this as we kind of go. Um, so the first thing I would do is if, if I was looking to go from 2D to 3D with this CAD, I would clean this up inside of CAD first. So I'd take off anything that I'm not going to be using when I'm actually building it inside of Revit. So perhaps things like notes, um, little specs on the doors, things like that. Just tidy it up. I actually did that with this one. The original had lots and lots of notes in it. Um, so just grabbing things perhaps that you don't want, selecting the, all the similar things and then just deleting them or the layers that you don't want. I would also then do um, a purge. So these are just sort of little things to tidy this up. Just purge the model, um, purge the, the CAD file for any kind of extra layers that you don't need, et cetera, that aren't being used. Also do an overkill to get rid of any lines that are on top of each other. This is really just cleaning this, this file up. Because this is a small CAD, it's not the, the end of the world if there's too much stuff in here. But when you get onto much, much larger projects with offices and and multiple stories, you're really going to want that CAD to be as small as possible um, with as few extra bits in it as you, as you can. Um, so once I'd done that in CAD, um, I would then um, essentially save it, maybe just go through a couple of times of the purge just to make sure everything is tidy, but just make sure it is how I'd want it to be. Um, one thing I would say is that what I used to do is I would split all the elevations and plans out into separate DWGs when I was bringing them into Revit. Um, I would shy away from doing that now just because if you have regular updates from your architect, you're going to have to do that every single time there's an update. So I actually leave my CAD exactly as, as it is here when I bring it to Revit. It, is, it does mean in some of my views I'm going to have all of this stuff there, but it means if I get an update, I can just replace the CAD file once. and I don't have to go through the whole process of splitting them out into their different elevations. And as long as the, um, the architect here doesn't move his CAD, then it's not going to affect what I get inside of Revit. So I'm going to use the new Revit file I have. So I'm just jumping back to Revit um, to do this. So 
having a quick look through the CAD, you would kind of have a rough indication of like how many levels perhaps there are and how many um, plans there's going to be. Um, the template that we have, as always, just comes with level zero, level one. Uh, it's kind of okay because what the, the house we're looking at there is just a, um, a two-story ground floor, ground floor and first floor. So what I would do here is I'd head to insert and I would link the CAD in. Um, and I'm going to do this in a plan view. I'm doing this on my level zero. Um, so I'm going to just link CAD. There is the option to import CAD. If you're working this way, do not import the CAD. Uh, the difference between link CAD and import CAD is link CAD is going to essentially link to DWG, which means um, it's pathed. If that path breaks, you're going to lose that CAD, but it does keep your Revit model lighter if it's linked. It also means that when you do get regular updates, all you need to do is just replace the file with the same name in the same place, and then that um, file will just um, reload the latest CAD file that you have. So I'm just going to go and find uh, where I put that CAD file. I'm just type that it's on my desktop, I believe. Um, here we go. It's the modern house. So before you bring anything in, just a couple of little tips. Um, you've got loads of options down here about how you actually bring that CAD file in. One of the things, um, again, that I used to do right at the beginning when I started using Revit was to un leave this unchecked and bring it in um, essentially into the entire Revit model. So uh, clicking this box will only bring it into this level zero view. If I don't have that box checked, what it does is it brings in like, um, it, it will put it in every single view, essentially. Um, what I mean by that is that it will actually come into 3D. It will be almost like it's a, a sheet of paper that if you, any of your views cut through it, you will see that view. Um, and it can just get a bit messy if you've got multiple sections, multiple elevations, multiple plans. Um, you kind of really just want to bring in the CAD, put it into the current view only, and only use what you need. So the other things that we have here are fairly self-explanatory. I've got the colors. I can invert, preserve, or black and white the colors. I'll just leave them as they are. Um, the other option we have is the positioning. I'm going to bring it in and place it manually. Um, but the only real the only real thing I think probably that's important is is this button here. Uh, there is auto detect on units if you get the units wrong. So if your um, CAD file is set up to say um, inches and you don't want it to be inches, you just need to make sure that this is set correctly. Ninety nine percent of the time you'll find that it is what you want. Um, so now I can bring this in, and I pressed a manual place option. Uh, so this is going to allow me to place it. So you'll see that my mouse here is a long way away from my CAD. That's actually my zero, zero in CAD. So you just want to make sure if you do manually place, that you are placing um, that your CAD file is relatively close to your zero, zero. Okay, so let's just make sure that I haven't got any questions as we're going. Cool. So what I'm going to need to do now is just move this so that this is going to be my ground floor. So I'm just going to move this into position. So I'm just going to pop this here. Um, make sure that is my ground floor. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first thing, these markers here, these are elevation markers. Um, I'm just going to move those slightly out of the way. And I'm just doing a left to right click and drag to move those. So um, I've got my DWG in now. This is great. Um, so I'm going to just crop this view down to the ground floor. The other option I would want to do when I put this in is to pin it. So I'm going to select it. And then just at the top here, I've got the option to pin. That's going to mean I don't accidentally move it um, when I'm working inside of Revit. OK, so now I'm going to add a crop view on. So in my properties, just click in the white space, just turn my crop views on here. Uh, I can just lock this down. Um, I will be discussing scope boxes in a bit. I'm just going to use the crop view just for the moment, just to get it down to this region. Um, when we come to use scope boxes, it's a quicker way if you have multiple stories to be able to crop views to exactly the right view. Okay, so the first thing I do now is I've got my CAD in place, head to the architecture tab, and then just copy over the grids. So I've got my C grid up here. Um, so I'm just going to type in C to my grid, and then I'm just going to copy this down. Boom. Oop, done this wrong way around. Doesn't matter, it's not too many. Put my slot on as well. Okay, here we go. So yeah, when I'm drawing these grids, what I should do is just make sure that the first one I place is the correct number or or um 
alphabet. So I'm going to select this grid, and a really useful little tool here is this Create Similar. Um, once you start fleshing out your model, it's really going to speed things up in the drawing process. So I'm just click one here, and then I'm just going to copy this across. So what you'll notice now is because I went from the right direction, as it goes one, two, three, four, and five. Um, and I've also got one of the yeah, just a cheeky six. So I'm just using the copy function up here to create these. There we go. Okay, um, so the reason I would draw the grids up first is because now that I've got the grids in, I have those on every single level, and it's going to mean that stacking these DWGs is going to be a lot easier. So I'm just going to select these grids, drag them across, and I'm going to do the same for these. You just need to grab these little pins at the end. It can be a bit elusive sometimes, uh, but I'll just take that across. There we go. Okay, so little tip, um, the DWG at the moment is really a really strong color. So when I'm drawing over the top of this, it's gonna be quite difficult to tell what is the Revit lines and what is the DWG lines. So what I'm gonna quickly do is just half tone my DWG. Really useful little tip. I press VG on my keyboard. You can also get to this by clicking on the white space, going to the properties here and clicking on visibility graphics. And you'll have the option here to change any of the views for your imported um, stuff so i've got my modern house dwg and i've got this little half tone at button uh end here incidentally i've got all of the layers that i could actually change the color of from my dwg this is why it's important to delete out extra layers that you you're not using in the dwg because they will show up here and it will be just more difficult to kind of sort out if you do need to change the color and rivet um those layers so if i apply this now i've got a really nice little half tone color on my dwg which is going to make it just a bit easier to um to work with. So now what I need to do is I'm going to grab this DWG. I'm going to use the copy function in my modify tools, top left, and I'm going to head to level one. And because I've got my grids in here, it's going to be really easy to use the paste function here, paste from clipboard. I'm just going to pop it anywhere. It really doesn't matter. And then I, what I can do now is I can use the align tool to stack the first floor over the top of my one there, over the top of my uh, first of all. So now when I'm building in 3D, I know that when I build the walls, they're going to go straight through the second floor. So hopefully this is kind of making it clear how I would work with this. I'm going to do that for every single view, the elevations, the levels, um, and just work my, work my way through stacking the DWG into the correct place. I would utilize view templates here. So one of the things that you can do is if you want to apply um, all of the settings that you have set up, from one view to the next, you can save all of those and use what's called a view template. So I'm going to say this view I want to be 1 to 50, and that's going to auto correct these grids to the right size. Um, I'm also going to, just because I've used grids, just point out another way that you can, um, or another tool that you can use to go between um, levels to see where things are. So if I wanted to say check that this back wall lines up with my first floor, I can use a um, reference plane, and these are really handy. So I'm going to just go to my architectural tab, find reference plane, boom, just draw a quick line down here. And there we go. Another one. So draw a reference plane up here. And when you put in a reference plane, a little tip, always name them. So you can name these. Um, and the reason you want to name them is because they're reference planes. They reference something. If somebody comes into your project and they're not named, they don't know what they're referencing. And these things can do quite a lot. So it is worth naming them so you know exactly what they are. Now, I might not be the back wall to some people, but just so I know what it is, I'm going to type in back wall. And if I go to my level one now, what I should see is that that lines up perfectly. There you go, back wall, back wall. So I know in 3D now, my z-axis, this is stacking exactly on top of each other. So that's absolutely perfect. This would be where you would see um, perhaps if the architect had made mistakes between the DWG, you would, this is where you would find them. The elevations might not line up, the sections might line, not line up, or the floors might not line up. But you will very quickly um, discover those kind of mistakes um, by doing this inside of Revit, because you're going to be doing this in every single view. But the best way to do that, so that you can see between each of the floors, is the grids or the reference planes. Okay. So now what I would do is I would go through all of these and set them all up. And like I said, um, view templates are very handy. So I've set this to 150. I've also half-toned the DWG. 
I might have set a whole load of other settings as well, which might be useful. But view templates are bread and butter inside of Revit for consistency and um, just keeping things neat and tidy. So I'm going to go to this view here, and I'm going to go to view templates, and I'm going to go create template from current view. And I'm going to call this uh, plan. Okay. So what I can do now is um, I have some other view templates in here, but essentially what this is, is a way of controlling everything about this view in terms of its settings um, and saving them all out so that I can use them against other, um, other views. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna click OK. So I've now created a plan uh, view template. And what you can do is I've just looked down here in the properties, uh, I've got under identity data view template. I can actually assign this plan to this view, which means it's tied to it now. So this is a really good way if you wanted to stop people from messing with either scales, different types of views. If you attach the view template to it, it's controlled by the view template and not by any of the um, view controls. I can then go to my level one. I can attach my plan view to this. Boom. And you can see it's one to 50 now, and I've got that half tone. If I want to change it afterwards, so if I wanted to go back to one to 100, because I've attached this plan view, I could go into uh, my view template and I could then change this to one to 100. And because I'm changing that view template now, any, any view that is tied to that view template is going to change. So it means that you can really keep consistency within your drawings. It's a really, really handy tool view templates. Okay, so hopefully it's clear what I would be doing now. Um, I'd be going through each of these views and I would be putting the DWG into each of them. Um, because of time constraints, like I say, we've got half an hour. We're not gonna have time to go through and do all of that and you really wouldn't wanna watch me doing that again and again and again. So what I'm gonna do is I'll just save this project and I'll just save it to project one in case I need to go back for any questions later. I'll close that down and I'll open one that I've actually done that for. So we've got a, a mid, webinar model here. So this is going to kind of show exactly um, part, part of the building that's been built and also all of those DWGs in place. So what I've done now, and it doesn't take that long when you get used to doing this kind of thing, you're just literally copying and pasting this into place and then using the align tool. So you could probably set this up in say 15 minutes um, for, for something even more complicated than this really. Each of my views now, I've got the um, the DWG overlaid. And what I've also done actually as well is I've actually added some levels into here. Um, so if I go to some of my sections, I had a few different levels in this model. I was very new to this model when I was setting this up. So um, I was kind of thinking about the best way to, to utilize levels in this. And what I've done is I've got a garage level, a finished floor level, a first floor level, um, a roof level, and the top of the parapet level. Um, you don't want to go putting levels all over the place inside of Revit. You really want them to be um, perhaps what, if you were thinking about somebody installing something, what they might measure off. So really important uh, features. There are other reasons why you might add other levels, but um, just in this case, this is the way I've added them in. So if I go to my first floor, we can kind of have a quick look at what we've done or what I've done here. Um, so I've added in some of the walls over the top. So what I'll quickly do is just delete some of these so you can see how I did this. So you can see the, the DWG underneath. Um, and I wasn't really quite, wasn't quite sure what this, this wall build up was. Um, it was a bit of an oddity really, but the way that I would work with this is the DWG underneath, I can snap to it. So I'm gonna just head to my annotate tab and find the aligned dimension tool. And then I can just take a dimension of the parts of the wall. So this wall was 100, again, not really sure what the build up of this was, but 115, 120, I guess that must be some kind of insulation, and then 115. So block, insulation block perhaps. Um, but the way I built this up was, or the way I would build this up to get the same hatching underneath um, and the same wall type is I can head to wall. And I've got a bunch out of the box uh, that I got with my architectural uh, template. I can say the template, if it contained all of the wall types, you wouldn't have to go through and set these up. You just have them on hand. Um, but as you work through projects, you can build up a library of these kind of things. So what I should have uh, is something near, I suppose. 
Um, I've created this 115, 120, 115 here, but the way that this works, or the way that you could do this yourselves is to click on edit type. Um, and I'm just gonna need to create a, um, a wall type in here that reflects this. So the way that that would work is I would wanna duplicate the type that I'm working on. Um, sometimes it's common for companies to uh, either add uh, just maybe add a little bit at the beginning of um, the type so that if this project is handed around um, you kind of know who was the originator so you typically might say put the three letter abbreviation for your company at the beginning of new types of walls or new types of materials or things like that so it's almost like a watermark if you like and it's also an easier way of finding things that you've created for this project so if i call this um, modern house and I'll be lazy and just say 115, 120, 115, and then hit OK. I then need to edit the uh, materials in here. So if I delete this end one, I've now got essentially what I would be looking at. Um, I guess the inside base here would be the structural wall. Um, so I just need to change that. Uh, so if I move this up and then have to move this to the outside. Uh, the core boundary here, whatever is structural, will, is going to need to go in the middle here. The reason for that is because that dictates um, when we put the floor on, what it, what the floor is going to sit on, if it needs to sit on. So if you had a hollow core plank, let's say, you might have the um, that floor sitting on top of your block work. Whereas perhaps if you've got hangers, you'll just be have you'll just have timber work on the outside face. But whatever is structural. So those hangers are going to need to hang on something, whatever structural needs to go into this core boundary here. And so that's going to be 115. Uh, this is going to be 20, and this is going to be 115. So now what I need to do is I need to set the materials. Um, so to do that, I can just click on the ends here, find what I need to uh, change this to. So I would just go through, find the, find the correct one. I can duplicate these materials and create my own. Um, but essentially, I'm not going to go through that now. I'll just use the one that I've created earlier. Um, but if I need to add walls, uh, I can use this wall that I've got here. Actually, I'll, I'll do it the normal way. So architecture, wall, find the correct wall. I've got the modern, um, where have I got it? 115, 120 here. And then some of your drawing options, I can use this pick lines here. Click on uh, a wall. I just need to make sure that I'm using the correct base. There we go, and it will just put that wall on there for me. Now, that's correct in plan. Obviously, in um, the z-axis, that wall might not be correct. So I would use the uh, levels that I've got to make sure that it is going from where I need it to. So the perhaps uh, so there is a subfloor. So there's so a garage foam floor right up to the roof. So now, if I take a quick section of that, I'm not going to have the DWG in there. But if I compare it to the other wall that I've got, then I can see exactly where it's going to. Um, so in 3D, I'm just going to click on my little dog kennel in my quick access toolbar. We can see that it does go from the bottom to the top, that wall. Um, I've got the power pet. Like I say, this is, a, is not a fleshed out, but hopefully that gives you an indication of how you would add the walls um, and other details as opposed to your um, DWG plan. So you would go around, um, keep on adding. So if I just select this wall here, I can hit create similar like I did before. I can use this pick lines tool and then I can just whoop, put it on the wrong side. No worries, I can use these flip tools, flip it onto the other side, and then it's, it's put in there. So it's very easy just to draw over the top of your DWG. Uh, this is what really is gonna take the time is just that kind of repetitive um, task. Uh, I can see I've got an underlay here, so I'm just gonna set that to none so I can't see the floor below it. Uh, but essentially, you would go around your model and just add in all the walls um, and copy over the top. Um, so the more details you have, you'd obviously need to have a section in here so you can see where things are going up to. Um, so the way that the floors work is exactly the same way as the walls work. You would look at your uh, look at your section. So I've got a bit of an odd build up down here. Uh, I think this is a screed, um, a concrete subfloor, and then um, some kind of um, gravel build up at the bottom um, but you would measure these out and do exactly the same as what I did with the walls you're just doing it with um, floors instead so to create the floors 
exactly the same edit type and you've got your structure in there. Okay, so very easy to copy over the top. Um, there isn't really too much to this. It's just the time taken to go over the top, create perhaps the types if you don't have them. Um, but as long as you've lined everything up um, correctly, you're gonna see this uh, filling in nicely as you start building up. One thing I would say when you are copying over the top is work in wireframe. So I wouldn't be able to see the DWG underneath if I've got hidden lines. So I need to work in wireframe when I'm doing this, just as a little tip. Um, so this is where you would also find out whether the architect has made any sort of errors, perhaps on these inside faces of the walls. Um, so if you're lining up windows with plans and things like that, you'll see very quickly if there's errors in the DWG. But once you've done this, the also benefit is that you can put sections anywhere you want inside of Revit, and you're gonna have those sections available to you. So once this is more built up around the DWGs, it's gonna be very easy to take sections and see things. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump to my finished uh, model, or my finished model. It was, it's by far not finished, but it's more fleshed out than what we have there. So if I go back to my end model, so that's my modern house. I haven't done too much more in this. I didn't spend a massive amount of time um, building this up, but I've just got more, slightly more details in here. Um, so in my sections, my plans. What I would do perhaps at this stage, I've still got a few more things to do, is I might go around uh, some of the online libraries to try and find things that are close to what I have in here. So perhaps the spec of the toilet um, and the bath, etc. cetera. Um, I'd be able to perhaps look through um, some of my, like I say, online libraries, which given no BIM object, um, BIM store, BIM stores, um, a, U a UK one, NBS library is also pretty good. Um, if you're looking for generic stuff, Revit City is a, is a library online. Be very careful about what you download from Revit City. It's completely unregulated. Um, but you would use all of these different libraries essentially to find perhaps some of these um, families that you need here. And families are just blocks. So if you're more used to AutoCAD, um, they're just 3D blocks essentially. You had um, companies that used to give away stencils for people to draw. You had then AutoCAD blocks that companies gave away. And now you just have families. So there's just been that evolution. Um, but yeah, essentially what we have now is a rough finished model. Um, I will just add a couple of details in the first floor so you can perhaps see how you do this. So we've got a couple of windows down here. And like I say, it'd be a case of finding the closest option, taking some measurements in here, and then adding the window that best fits. Uh, so this is not perhaps the correct window. Um, but if I just exactly the same as I did before, I need to duplicate this, create a 1200 window, uh, set the rough width. So this particular window has some parameters in it that allows me to do this. And then I can just pop that over the top and then align it. So that's obviously, again, going to be right in plan, but in section might not be correct. So I have in my north and south. So what I need to do in here is just make sure that they do line up and this one just happens to be exactly the right height and i just need to do that with the other windows so while i'm doing this the benefit of all of this being in 3d is i've got a little application called enscape here it is not something that comes with revit but it's just to show you kind of perhaps having a 3d model why it's beneficial in revit 2021 the rendering capabilities have got much better uh, but if you're looking at perhaps uh, just this model and getting sort of a decent idea of what it looks like. Uh, Material-wise, I've not spent any, these are just out of the box materials. That floor could do with changing over there. Um, but now I have the 3D, I have these options. I have the options to create these, perhaps these 3D views that I can put into the sheets, etc. So that has been a whistle-stop tour of going from 2D to 3D, um, from your DWGs to Revit. A few different processes in there. Um, so I hope that's been useful, um, but hopefully you can see perhaps the benefits of having uh, a 3D model um, over the 2D. First of all, it's going to mean all those views line up, which is great uh, when you send them out. And what you can also do from Revit is actually create DWGs anyway. So if somebody couldn't work with this, you can always send them the DWG. So I hope this has been helpful. Like I said, this was a really snappy half an hour webinar. 
Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up, um, but if there are any questions, I'll hang around at the end for a couple of minutes. Um, I hope everyone's been able to hear me and I haven't just been talking to myself. There's still 16 people on, so I assume that that all went smoothly. Um, like I say, I'll, I'll stay for a couple of minutes. If there are any questions, let me know, but I'll just stop the webinar, webinar sort of maybe in a minute or two. Thanks, Martin. Walter. I hope everyone's well, by the way. Um, I didn't say that right. I'm not sure if I said that right at the beginning, but um, yeah, I hope everyone's staying inside. Okay, it looks like there are no questions. Um, I'm going to stop the webinar now. If there are any other questions that you need uh, to ask, please do get in touch with the man and machine. Um, it sounds like my wife may have just cut her finger on a knife or something. So everybody stay safe. Um, thank you very much for your time. And um, hopefully, if, uh, if there are any questions, do feel free in touch, get in touch with the man and machine. Okay, bye now. Bye.